Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. Today, NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past as today we don't have any future. Well, Larry Mack, you taken the deal with Robert Yates and Davey was evidently quite the ordeal. You took it, then you didn't take it, then you took it again, and you finally reached a deal at a Waffle House in the wee early morning hours. Uh, take me through that whole process. When did Davey first approach you in the garage? Yeah, it just seems like in 1990, um, the 28 and the 26 was parked together in the garage a lot. You know, they're parked by how they are in owner points, and it just seemed like we were kind of tooth and nail the entire the entire time. Um, sixth and seventh, fifth and sixth, eighth and ninth, and Davy and I would talk a lot, and a lot, a lot of people tied Davy and I together because of us both be, being from Hueytown, Birmingham area. But okay. there really was not a tie there. About the time that I left Birmingham, Davy was really just getting started racing, and the only Allison I really knew or had any, any. Uh, relationship with you might say it was donnie allison that we talked about before but it seems like when we were parked in those garages and i remember richmond virginia in particular and i don't remember if it was a spring race or the fall race but david just said if you'll just come help me get this 28 car pointed we will wear them out he said we got so much horsepower <laughs> yeah. but he said we can't do nothing with it and i yeah, yeah you know we yeah 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 i hear you but we just talked. You know, we wouldn't necessarily talk about that. We would talk about our race cars and different things around Birmingham. And, again, at the end of, of 1990, um, Robert and I talked at Phoenix. We went up in the 28 hauler and we talked. And Phoenix then was the next to the last race of the year. The last race was at Atlanta. And there was actually a, an off weekend, I think, between Phoenix and Atlanta. And... I accepted the job, and but it was one of those deals where I accepted it, but the minute I walked out of the hauler, I was second-guessing myself. Not because of anything negative with Robert Yates or Davey Allison or the 28 car. I mean, that was, that was exactly what a crew chief would be looking for. But I guess my heart was still with Kenny Bernstein and that 26 car because I felt like that – I won't say single-handedly. I don't think anybody does anything single-handedly, but I had I had start and built that race team into a team that had won three races. It was your baby. Yeah. yeah. I, I really looked at it <laughs> yeah. that way. It yeah. was Kenny Bernstein's team, Kenny Bernstein's money, but it's like it was my blood, sweat, and tears for yes, sir. ever yeah. since he bought it in late 85. And so we went to Atlanta to test – uh, the next week, the off week, and I just couldn't get it off my mind. And at lunchtime, I got in a rental car and drove over to the 7-Eleven across the street from Atlanta Motor Speedway and called Robert on the payphone. And I said, Robert, I know you're going to think I'm not, not much of a man, and I, I regret, I'm so sorry, because I did something that's supposed to be worth a man's word. I shook your hand, but I said, Robert, I can't do it. And I explained to him, and he says, Larry, yeah, I'm disappointed. I'm a little upset, but he said, I get it. I've been in this sport a long time, and when you have loyalty to people, that's not a bad thing. And he said, I'm disappointed. I know Davey's going to be disappointed, but we understand it. So started the 1991 season off with, with Brett in the 26 car, which would have been Brett's second year. Had a rough Daytona Speed Weeks. And I don't remember really how we ran maybe the second or third race like at Richmond and Rockingham, but we went to Atlanta, and we sat on the outside of the front row and sat there and ran inside the, the top three, four, and the reins moved in 
I think, before lap 30 on Sunday. But in the interim, very early in that race, obviously, Davey had wrecked. Jake Elder was the crew chief. And I guess what I found out later, Jake had refused to fix the car. You know, car was tore up pretty bad, but it happens, 500-mile race at Atlanta, you know, 334 laps, and it happens before lap 20. You, you give it an effort to try to get it back out there, especially in the system of the points back then. But I guess Jake refused to, to fix it, and they loaded it <laughs> up and came home. Wow. Okay. So we go back in there and we restart the race the next day. And, again, we're running well inside the top five, and we didn't, I bet you we didn't run 20 laps. We blew up, which we fought a lot with that 26 car. And so Linda and the two oldest kids, my youngest wasn't even born yet, we were there, had, we drove our minivan down, and, and we loaded the kids up in the minivan, and Linda and I got in it. We, this, again, Monday, we drive back to, to Charlotte, and I bet her and I didn't say ten words to each other. And what, we were mad at each other. I wasn't right. mad at her. Yeah. It's like yeah. I'm just – I'm just kind of beside myself. It's like, what in the world? Get the weight of the weight. Just can't get this yeah. thing rectified. It's like we can get we can get two of the three parts working, but the third one always fails us. Whether it's the car, whether it's the the engine, driver, what we just can't get all three plugged in on a regular basis. So we drove home, and I knew as soon as I got home, Kenny would be calling again. Him and I talked. <laughs> Yeah. 365 days a year, and even though I have nothing to do with engines, I I can promise you I was going I was probably going to take an ass chewing, and that's okay, <laughs> but because yeah. I ultimately yeah. I'm responsible. So we drive back, and Linda takes the kids in, and it's still it's still daylight, and uh, I'm unloading the van, and I told her I don't want to talk to nobody tonight. You know, if Kenny calls, tell him I'm gone somewhere, I'm running in there and going to get a gallon of milk, whatever. I'll talk, deal with it tomorrow. So sure enough, I heard the phone ring and Linda opened the door to the garage out of the kitchen and said, Larry, telephone. It's like, really? <laughs> Did I not tell you? And she looked I told at me you. like, I'm like, you might just want to take this phone call. Wow. So I picked up the phone. Hello. Robert Yates here. He said, Larry, I know where you stand. We've had this conversation, and I respect that. But he said, I'm going to make a crew chief change in the morning, and we just wanted to make one more run at you. Are you interested? I said, when and where do you want to meet? And, again, we met at the Waffle House, Sunset Boulevard, right off of I-77. Must have sat there to 3 or 4 in the morning and, uh, and struck a deal. Just you and Robert? Just Robert and I, yeah. And what was comical, this was leading into – one or two off weekends. Remember, back then yeah. we had a lot more off yeah. weekends yeah. than what they have today. So we were leading in two off weekends. Davey had left Atlanta and went to Donnie and the boys, Donnie Allison and the boys' property down in South Alabama and was hunting. Of course, no, no, no cell phones, no phone service. But I guess a, a day or two after we struck this deal, Sam Mance, Davey's pilot, got in touch with Davey and said, Davey, you might want to call Robert. I don't know what's going on up there at the shop, but they've hired some guy named Mac Reynolds as your crew. <laughs> <laughs> and Davey was pretty, pretty ecstatic. So you come on board with Robert Yates Racing. How quickly did you know that you were on to something with yeah. this team? Yeah, you know, the good news is to walk into that situation, which was a little intimidating. I, I think a lot of the guys there that I knew, because, again, we've been parked beside each other in the garage here, it seemed like for two solid years, Joey Knuckles, Raymond Fox, all those, Jeff Clark, I knew them, but I think they had their guard up a little bit. You know, it's like, okay, this guy, he's only won a couple of three cup races. He's going to take our deal and – turn it into a consistent winner. So I, it was a little intimidating for them, and I think it was a little intimidating for me. But the good news is we had those two off weeks that we didn't. I didn't take the job on Monday night, and we had to be at a racetrack on Thursday or Friday. And we actually, the next race was Darlington, uh, and we, we lined a, a test up to go to Darlington uh, the next week, the second off week. And we went down there, and I remember – I don't remember, Rick, how many laps Davey ran the first run, five or six or seven or something. But I remember when he came in and dropped the window net, and I looked down in to talk to him. It's like, this is going to be good. 
This is really, mm -hmm. it was just like you just knew it. Yeah. And I remember we had a really good test. Uh, lunchtime, I couldn't wait to go find a payphone to call Linda and tell her, I, I think this is going to be really special. This is going to be good. It's almost like immediately Davey and I were finish, finishing each other's sentences. You actually called on a payphone. What? What's a payphone? What, what's yeah, this thing you're talking about? <laughs> nobody probably watching this or listening to this is going to know what a payphone, but we didn't know what cell phones were back then. It's something you had to have a quarter to put in to make a phone call. Well, you come on board, and you proceed to win five races that year. Well, four races plus Sonoma. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. Okay, all right. <laughs> in all There's seriousness. no asterisk by <laughs> the record. How huge was that for you personally? Because you'd been plugging along, you know, throughout the 1980s, winning a race or two here and there. But this was like you'd been shot out of a cannon. Yeah. What you, was that like for well, you? Well, one, Davey was right. If we could just get that thing pointed coming off the corner – I yeah. knew who was going to win the drag race down each straightaway, and it was going to be that Robert and Doug Yates horsepower under the hood. But it was kind of weird. I mean, we went to Darlington, and we finished second to Ricky Rudd, first race out, ironically, to Ricky Rudd. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we were top five and top ten in every week. You know, I think we finished top five at Wilkesboro, top ten at Bristol, or top five. Um but it just couldn't couldn't win that race. And I was actually getting a little bit frustrated. I mean, I never thought I would be disappointed in week after week finishing in the top five and top ten, but I was actually getting a little bit frustrated. And we go to the two weeks of Charlotte. And the all-star race, of course, was the first one, and just wore them out. I think yeah. we sat on the pole, and I think we maybe led every lap. I think that was before the invert deal. Uh, I think they changed the rules after that. I think they did for the next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, for, for 92, one hot night. So that gave me a lot of confidence. But it's still, it's like it's, this is not a points race. This is a special event. And we went back out there the next week and, and just annihilated him in the 600. I, you know, I spent most of the day trying to slow him down. And there's a funny little sidebar story to that 600. Davey already had kind of learned – what buttons he could push with me and and <laughs> and, and get yeah. my goat. Yeah. And um, we were late in the race. And, you know, back then, Rick, 600 miles, 400 laps at Charlotte was, was tough. Yeah, it was. Uh, hard Still equipment. Yeah. Yeah. You knew you were on borrowed time. You were running 100 more miles at a very tough racetrack, 100 more miles than we did anywhere else. And you knew it was the equipment you were asking a lot out of it, where it was the car, the transmission, the gear, the engine. You were asking a lot out of the equipment on that race car. And we probably had a good half a lap lead with not many laps to go. And ironically, Earnhardt was running second in the three car. And Davey hadn't said nothing on the radio in a while. And we didn't have to make any more pit stops unless the caution came out. And all I would do is give him 30 to go, 25 to go, interval back to second. And, again, spent time trying to slow him down a little bit. You know, you got a half a lap lead. You got a 15-second lead. But the only way you'd slow down, Davey Allison down is if you did something to the car to slow him down. <laughs> he wasn't going to do it on his own. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyhow, with about – 15, less than 20 laps to go, he finally came on radio and said, Larry Mack, you'll never believe what's happening. And my, my heart just got <laughs> lodged up in my throat. I went, oh, you got to be kidding me. Here it is. The engine's Here we go down. again. Yeah. Will Barron's going out. Something's happening. And I said, what is it? What is it? He said, every time I come off turn two and look to the infield, there's an Earnhardt fan hanging through the fence flipping me off with both hands. <laughs> I said, Davey, I'm so glad you shared that with me. I'm not sure I would have made it through the day. <clears throat> but what an overwhelming eight days for me. We won the All-Star Race on Sunday. Linda was in the hospital, pregnant with our with Brandon, our second child. Okay. And that week I was I was playing shuffle game with Brooke, our two-year-old. Yeah, yeah. Carolyn Yates was helping. We didn't have no family here. Carolyn Yates, Robert's wife, was helping me with Brooke. And I'm going between the hospital and the shop, and I'm on the phone from the hospital talking to the shop, but trying to make it all work. So we won the all-star race on Sunday. 
Brandon was born on Tuesday afternoon, and he was premature. And they felt like he was probably going to have to stay in the hospital a good three or four weeks because he was he was under five pounds. Was he, was, he really? He was four weeks premature. Yeah. So he's born on Tuesday. I'm still going back and forth between the racetrack now and the hospital, still making sure Brooke's okay. Well, again, back to the no cell phone era. I was walking to Pitt Road right before the race on Sunday for the 600, and Terry Reno, a really close friend of ours, good friend of Linda's, but both of ours, came and grabbed me on Pitt Road. She said, Larry, right before I left the house, I talked to Linda, and they're going to release her and Brandon tonight. <laughs> so all-star race win on Sunday. Brandon's born on Tuesday. We win the 600. I make sure the car gets through all the inspection process, drive to the hospital, pick Linda and Brandon up, and take them home. Most overwhelming eight days I could have ever imagined having. Holy cow, man. So oh, wow. Very cool. So you go from 1991, first year with Davey, you go into 1992, and Larry Mack, you and I have talked before. I don't know of any race team in general and any crew chief in particular that dealt with more than you guys did in 92, 93, and 94. Yeah. Um, you could write books. You could make movies off of it. Um, start with 1992. What goes through your mind when you think of that year? That if you look at the almost 70-year history of NASCAR, that I, you could look low and high and far and near, and I don't think you could ever find a driver in a race team that went through so many highs, and there was yeah. a lot of highs, yeah, yeah, and in so many lows. I just don't know if it would be physically possible to find a team that, that endured so much. Uh, <clears throat> how could you start the season any any bigger than winning the Daytona 500? And we got into a little bit of a deal, it seemed like. We were winning one week and wrecking one week. Winning one week, wrecking one week. And, of course, when we got to the All-Star race, we figured out how to do both on the same night. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was, it was a very up-and-down roller coaster. And... You know, you, you win this race and your driver's being airlifted to the hospital. How, how, do you, how are you supposed to feel? You know, it's like I just want to get to the hospital and check on Davey. Uh, I remember sitting on a cooler behind our hauler. <clears throat> this just goes to show you a little bit about the, the camaraderie in that yeah. garage area yeah. back then and even today. But I remember sitting on a cooler right after uh, the race and almost just sitting there kind of in a funk, um, waiting to load this destroyed race car up and get to the hospital. And, and Tim Brewer, crew chief for, of course, Bill for junior, um, walked over and sat down on the cooler and he says, man, y'all tore some race cars up. And I said, Tim, you have no idea. I said, we are out. I said, we that what you just saw is it, other than our Daytona Talladega cars and our Sonoma car. I said, we are out. I said, the guys are working as we speak on our, we, we would have hoped would have been our backup car for the 600, but now it's going to be our primary. And, of course, we're getting ready to go to the Charlotte, the Dover, the Pocono, the Michigan, the Sonoma. You know, we're getting ready to do this, this little trek. And he says, um, why don't Monday – why don't you send Norman up up to Ingle Hollow? He said, I got a car up there that, that we actually won one of those four in a row with back, you know, earlier in the year. He said, we're not using it. He said, just stick it in the top of the hauler and keep it as a backup and keep it as long as you need it. And the whole month of June, in the top of that hauler was a Budweiser car <laughs> with Texaco Havlin decals stuck down in the right window in case we ended up having to use it somewhere. I think that's the most incredible story because, as we know, Atlanta that year, the championship comes down to the 11 car. Well, at that, at that point, Rick, you know, the seven wasn't even in the picture. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. It, already at that point, it you know, Mark Martin and them were flirting with some good runs and <laughs> Harry Gant, but it, it looked that like that at that point it was going to be the 11 and the 28. 
you know, going down to the wire on this deal. But just so many other things happen that that ancillary things, you know, Pop Allison, Bobby's dad, Davy's grandfather passed away. And the same weekend at Bristol, we crashed and, and he cracked some ribs. And then the next week, we go to North Wilkesboro, and we're just trying to make sure Davey starts that race because, again, we're yeah. already in the thick of this championship. And Jimmy Hensley did most – he did about all the practice, and Davey ran a few laps in happy hour. But Jimmy Hensley ran majority of the practice in qualifying, and it didn't take long in that race. I mean, it was about 90 degrees that day, and poor Jimmy Hensley stood there all day long in the pits <laughs> with a yeah. uniform on and his helmet under his arm. But it didn't take long to realize, I believe we got a race car that can win this race. And I walked over probably 150 laps in the race, and I said, Jimmy, we appreciate what you've done, and you are welcome to stay with us, but I'm telling you, he ain't getting out of that car. <laughs> and he yeah. didn't, and we ended yeah. up winning the race. Yeah. Uh, just the, the things like that, and then, of course, going all the way to Atlanta and, and s- s- having a shot at that championship uh, because – we got to late summer, early fall, we were kind of tripping all over our shoelaces. And the 11 was too. And that's when Kawicki became a player in this thing. But I, I say we were tripping all over our shoelaces. You know, we, we, we weren't running like we needed to run. But at the same time, it seemed like every week we were just trying to make Davey comfortable in that car from the Pocono crash. Yeah. And even though we went to Atlanta with the points lead, so it was ours to lose, and we lost it, I still will go to my grave saying we lost that championship at Pocono. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. of destroying another good race car and working with a driver that probably didn't need to race the rest of the year, if the truth yeah. be known. But – working with a driver, especially for the next month or two, just trying to get him comfortable in that race car. And um, it just it's a year that I'll never forget. It was a character-building year. I mean, again, the highs and the lows, I, if, you, if you grafted it, 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 it's a graph that would probably make you dizzy between yeah. the ups and the downs throughout the entire season. Tell me about Pocono. What do you remember about that accident? Yeah. Uh, we had a really good car and we had, we had dominated a lot of that race and we had a jack fail on a pit stop and, and got behind, but it was early enough. I mean, it was past the halfway point, but this was the, the, the old days of 200 laps and 500 miles at Pocono and it was past halfway, but, but I remember telling Davey, we can get back. We can do it. I mean, the car was in its own zip code. And I remember as he caught Daryl, as we know, and, and Daryl's one of my best friends today. I worked with him for 19 years, stood beside him in a booth for 15 years. But I knew when I took that deal that there was some bad blood between Daryl and the Allisons. Uh, it was mainly between Daryl and Bobby, but I think it was hereditary. <laughs> I think it just yeah, got passed yeah. down the pipe to Davey. Yeah. Heck, the second or third race I was working with Davey at Bristol in 91, I mean, Davey spun him out coming off four. I can't challenge that. And they put Davey to the rear of the field. Uh, and we had a rain delay, and I walked down there to check on the car and Davey in one and two, and there, him and Daryl are nose to nose, pointing their <laughs> finger in each other's yeah. chest. Yeah. So I knew I'd kind of inherited this as well. Yeah. But I watched him catch Daryl, and Daryl had a pretty good car that day. It was not in the same zone as the 28. I mean, Daryl ended up winning the race. Uh, which kind of added insult to injury on top of it. But I, I watched going down in the one, down the long straightaway, Daryl chopped him about two or three laps in a row. And I even told him on radio, I said, Davey, be patient. Just pass him. When you know you can pass him, don't get yourself in trouble. And so same thing happened this lap. Watched him chop him going in the one. And, um, you know, we didn't all, – all you know is what you hear on the radio – and I heard, I saw the caution flag waving, and uh, I knew they, we had to be somewhere probably on the backside. And I heard Terry Thromberg, our spotter, go, "Davy, you okay? Davy, you okay?" Wow. And and Robert, who scanned NASCAR, 
and who scanned other drivers, I looked around at him and he was as white as a sheet because of what he was hearing NASCAR and other drivers that drove by that wreck. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we knew once we got to the infield care center and they had airlifted him that it didn't appear there were any life-threatening injuries, but that he was hurt. And we got all our stuff loaded up. And, and again, I remember driving out. We used to go backwards down the front straightaway after the race to go out the gate mm -hmm. between two and three. And I remember – looking over and seeing Daryl in that 17 bunch celebrating victory lane. It made me just want to stop the car and get out and go over there and, yeah. and just yank them out of victory lane. It's like, how in the hell can y'all celebrate? Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, we go to the hospital and on the way to the hospital, Robert <clears throat> and I are, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What do you think we need to do? And we get to the hospital and Judy, Allison, met us, <laughs> met us in the, the hallway, and she says, guys, I just want to tell you, he does not look the greatest. He's very swollen from the G-forces. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, we walked in that room, and the poor little guy, his ears looked like they were back around on the back side <laughs> of his head. Yeah. His forehead looked like it was about that big just from the swelling. Yeah. But he looked at us. And he didn't say, hello, how are you? He looked at us and says, I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. I'm going to kill that son of a bitch dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then he says, what are you guys doing here? Well, Davey, we want to come check on you and see, see how you are. Get back to Charlotte and get my Talladega car ready. Okay, but we, we may be – he said, no, there's no talking about it. I will be in Talladega, and I will run that race. Well, we had lost the points lead – by virtue of wherever Bill finished and the, the wreck that we had. So we go to Talladega, and weirdest weekend, Bobby Hillen, who didn't have a ride, we took him down there, practiced the car, qualified the car. We'd been working with Les Richter and, and uh, Dick Beatty on, on Davey. You know, Davey came over to a hangar over on the backside of the racetrack on Saturday. We took a show car over there practicing getting him in and out of the race car. And um, so Davey's going to start the car at the rear of the field, and Les Richter called Robert and I over to the trailer on Saturday. One, Davey had to make some laps in that car. So we got him over there, and he made a couple of three laps in the car by himself on Saturday. So we got over to the NASCAR hauler, and I said, Les, I said, I think we got a good plan. I said, you know, Davey's going to start at the rear of the field. And I said, we'll just stay out of harm's way, and then we'll get the first caution. And he stopped me and says, you don't have a plan. We got a plan. You'll play by our plan. <laughs> he says, we will make the decision when he gets out of that car. He said, caution or no caution. We're allowing you to let him start that race. By the way, with his hand Velcroed to a shifter, we're not going to have him out there yeah. very long yeah. in, in this in this." Environment And this was Richter or Beatty? Les Richter. Okay. And he says he starts at the rear, and if he so much as passes a car, <laughs> he, we will bring him in, yeah. and you'll get him out then. And, and, Rick, we start that race, and there is not a cloud in the flipping sky. That sky is as blue as blue could be. I was there that and day. And about lap yeah. 11, yeah. just got this little rainstorm. Not even enough to wet the racetrack. But enough that they threw the caution, and we got Davey out, got Bobby in, and we'd have won that race that day if Bobby Hillen hadn't have panicked on me. Oh. It came down <laughs> to four race cars. Yeah. Two Junior Johnson cars, Bill and Sterling, Ernie Irvin in the four, and Bobby Hillen in the 28. Well, I knew, even though it was three Fords and a Chevrolet, that it was it was the, it was this twenty eight and this four versus these two junior Johnson Fords. So Tony Glover and I we had to make a green flag stop late in the race, and we were running I think maybe third. Junior's cars were leading, and Tony Glover and I had been communicating. No matter what the junior Johnson cars did, we were going to pit together. We were both going to do the same thing, and no matter what those cars did, we were coming together. Well, here comes the Junior Johnson cars peeling off, and Hill and panic and said, I, I, they're pitting, I'm pitting with them, and left poor Ernie Irvin. Uh, which Ernie yeah. was known to win yeah. the race, yeah. but we'd have won that race. We still finished third and still took the points lead back. 
so you go from that, and like you said earlier, you were just keeping Davy comfortable in the car, and then Clifford's accident happened. Was there ever a chance that Davy was going to get out of the car even then? Nope. Yeah. You know, we uh, it was Michigan weekend right. in August, and the Xfinity Series cars were, were up there a day early. I keep going back to it. No cell phones. Nobody had cell phones. And we, Davey had good friends up there that lived on the lake near the racetrack that he would go up and, and stay with uh, John LaFere and his wife. And he had went up there on Tuesday or Wednesday to hang out with them and fish or whatever. And so we were actually flying commercial up. And we had left the shop right before lunchtime and we all went home to clean up and when I got home Linda says Larry you need to call the shop and I said what's the matter she says something's happened to Clifford Michigan so I called back the shop Robert was still at the shop or he's already back at the shop he said I think Clifford has been killed in a in a crash in Michigan it's like oh my gosh you've got to be kidding me and so I go back to the shop we fly up to Michigan and get to the hotel, the Hampton Inn there in Ann Arbor, and Robert and I were rooming together, and we're trying to find Davey and get in touch with Davey. Finally got in touch with him. And I was on the phone with him. I said, Davey, I, I said, what what do you want us to do? I, I said, I know I can call, um, um, oh, my gosh, Jim Sauter. I think he's available. He says, Why? I said, well, Davey, I, I would assume you want to go back to Uetown. He said, let me tell you something. He said, yeah, my brother was killed today. And, of course, remember, this is just a month or a little less than this crash he had at, at, at Pocono. He said, yeah, my brother was killed today. And he said, it, I've got a hole in me that burns when the wind blows. But he said, I'm here to do a job, and I'm going to do my job, and we're going to win this race on Sunday, and then we'll go back and take care of business in Hueytown. It, it's so amazing. It took Davey, who had this horrendous crash at Pocono, who just had lost his brother, it took him to get Robert and I straightened out. We were the ones ready to, to bail on this deal. Yeah. You know, not bail on the race, but put somebody sure. else in it yeah. to let him go home and, and grieve his brother's loss. But that – that that's why even today he's still my inspiration